when you were at this age or when you were like 10, mm. who was your role model? Was it someone in the family? Was it someone you saw in the papers or the television that made you just feel this? That why, why is this strong sense of justice that you, that you have in you? Well, let me say hello to everybody, and thank you so much for being here. So, role models. Uh, I had many when I was starting out. I think uh, one of the ones I remember is in my first job out of college. So, we have a saying that, congratulations, you've finished university, you're going to hate your first job. <laughs> I don't know if that's true everywhere, but um, my first job, I had a mentor named Kay Coles James and she was the highest ranking African-American in the government at the time. And she was born um, on a kitchen table in public housing to a mother who was on welfare and faced such discrimination in America. Uh, but she had such drive and perseverance and empathy. Uh, and I really learned those things from her. Nice. Um, the job that you have today, it's partly tech, partly, well, empathy, emotions. Right. How do you combine these two? How do you balance these two when you're making decisions? And you're running this company that has $100 million to spend for good causes. How, how yeah. do you balance? Well, at Google, we really br believe in bringing together technology with empathy. And that's why Larry and Sergey, our founders, before they even started the company, before they went public, they said, we are going to dedicate 1% of our net profit every year to philanthropy, to google.org, and our employees' time, right? And so our CEO, Sundar, earlier this year, in fact, made a billion-dollar five-year commitment to google.org to work on issues like education, the future of jobs, diversity, and thinking about how do we apply technology to these humanitarian issues with empathy. And we don't believe that you can separate them, right? And so some of our best entrepreneurs globally who we're working with are thinking about problems from the user perspective. At Google, we always say, focus on the user. And so what that means for us at Google.org is really thinking about the human beings involved, both as we think about assessing the problems, you know, take something like homelessness or poverty. So understanding the data and the evidence, of course, but then also thinking about the humanity behind it. So maybe looking at human biases and how there's systemic injustice and how that might be playing a role, for example, in the United States right now with criminal justice reform. How heartbreaking is your job? How much, how much time you cry? You know, it's funny. I was talking to my team before I came out, and I told them, I'm going to cry, all right? <laughs> I'm going to cry. I'm a weeper. <laughs> uh, but I don't cry from the sadness. I cry because <laughs> I get so inspired by the people, just like the people I see in this room, who are thinking about how they're going to take their power, their privilege, their education, their knowledge of the world, and how to apply that to the problems of the world. Uh, I get inspired by people like, there's a woman I, I work with, uh, Nadine Burke-Harris, for example. She's a doctor, physician, and she went to the poorest neighborhood in the Bay Area and said, this is where I'm going to work. She's the leading pe pediatrician in America. And you know, to your point about data-driven, human-focused, technology, and empathy. What she has discovered is that when we look at an issue like health, we have to look at the data and the evidence. But we need to look beyond that to understand the humanity there. So she has looked at the importance of, chi of adverse childhood events or ACEs. Think about trauma like child abuse or poverty or homelessness, and looked at the links between that and health and has basically said, we're not going to cure this pandemic of asthma and other um, diseases that we're seeing unless we understand the humanitarian roots. So it's people like Nadine Burke-Harris who inspire me every day. Or there's a woman named um, Dita who I met last year in Czech Republic. She started a group. She's young, savvy, tech savvy, um, just brilliant, <laughs> driven. And she was thinking, I want to work on this problem of getting more women and girls into technology. 
And she created Chiquitas, which is a program teaching young girls, teaching women to code. So I, I am relentlessly hopeful <laughs> when I meet people like that and see what they're doing to change the world. I'm sure your job has a lot of these high points, like a lot of peak points. But when we, when we speak about the projects that you decide to finance and help, yeah. when, which is the peak point? When you make the decision and you sign the contract, or when you go on the <laughs> field, or when you look, at, look back at that area like a year later and see? So what, what is the best about it's that? All it's, yeah, all, it's all amazing. It's all wonderful. So. It's all wonderful. Um, I'll give you a, a couple of examples of highlights. Um, I think for me, when it all comes together and we see vision met with technology, met with that sort of relentless determination that I will not fail is so inspiring. So I'll give you one example. I was in Australia recently. We did an impact challenge where Google goes to a location and says, give us your best ideas. And we want to hear from all the local innovators about the best approaches to problems here locally. So uh, the issue that this group took on was homelessness. Uh, this is a very serious issue globally. And in Australia, it really surprised me to learn that one in 200 people did not have a permanent home in Australia at the time. But what was interesting is there was a group there called Info Exchange, and they had figured out that, interestingly enough, about 80%, 80%, of the homeless in Australia had access to a smartphone. Now, because of a lack of income, they didn't have data plans, but they could get free Wi-Fi occasionally. And you know, the issue is one we see in many markets where there's market failure. There's more than 350,000 services available to the homeless uh, in a place like Australia. And yet the typical story is that a woman suffers domestic violence she has to flee in the middle of the night with her children. And she doesn't know where to go. And maybe she hears that there's a shelter. And she shows up in the middle of the night with all that she can carry, only to be told at the front door, no room at the inn. So this happens again and again and again. And it's a market failure. But this group, Info Exchange, figured out, hey, we can make a marketplace and a connection between the services that are available and the needs of the people so that they know about job training and food and shelter. And what was so amazing about this story, and this is where I think all of you, I hope that this story inspires you because you are the answer you've been waiting for, my friends. Mm. So a woman at Google, a young woman, a product manager, found out about this organization and said, I want to help. And I bring my story. And her story is that growing up in Australia, she had had to flee a domestic violence situation with her mother with her siblings, so she personally knew what it was like to have to run in the middle of the night and not know where to go and not know services. So that product manager at Google was able to participate and contribute and roll up her sleeves and volunteer and dig in and be part of the solution. And that team, Info Exchange, uh, has now blossomed. We've given them additional resources so that they can uh, take their solution and not only expand it across Australia, but globally. And it all comes down to people like you figuring out what am I passionate about? What is the issue that really drives me? And how can I take the best of who I am and offer that in service of the greatest humanitarian needs? Did you say in the beginning that you not only dedicate this amount of funding for these issues, but also workers at your company dedicate yeah. their time? Uh, how do you see, what is, what is this sentence? What is that magic trick that invites people so that finally they feel, I want to do this, I want to volunteer, I want to be part of this because it's good? What, what is it that drives them? Mm. So someone I really recommend reading, if you haven't seen him or read him yet, is Brian Stevenson. Um, he's one of my heroes. 
And he talks about how important it is to get proximate. Get proximate. So we as human beings, left on our own, I think we're actually very caring and mm -hmm. empathetic when we know the person, when they're a neighbor, when they're someone who we feel like we can relate to in a personal way. But you know, we have so many systems in our lives, especially as we get more wealth or more privilege or more power that distance us from need. And we'll spend our days uh, you know, in gated communities or building walls and separating ourselves. So I think the important thing that I learned from someone like a Brian Stevenson is the importance of getting proximate to make sure if I want to take on an issue and help that I actually go and learn and that I learn and listen to the people who know the issue the most, the ones who are personally experiencing it and walk a moment in their shoes. So for example, at Google, if we're thinking about how to help, for example, the LGBT community, then we're going to listen to our Googlers. We have a group called Gaglers. We're going to listen, mm. and we're going to show up together, and we're going to think about, how can I help? But first, let me listen. I'm sure that what you do, and this organization that you're running, has made a lot of change on this field, but how did the fact that you deal with these humanitarian issues and, and being charitable. How did that change you uh, <laughs> as a first? How did it change your life? Well, I think um, it's actually being engaged in the issue, I think, actually makes you more hopeful. I don't know about you all, but sometimes when I read the newspapers and I see what's happening in current events, sometimes it makes me depressed. And sometimes I feel the challenges that we're facing, whether extinction of species, oh my goodness, um, you know, climate change, political issues, I can get disheartened. And the thing that actually makes me feel better is when I personally engage. And when I'm working alongside these heroes, these people that I'm mentioning, who are really figuring out how to bring these solutions to scale. So the thing that actually, uh, you know, about this life, people say sometimes, oh, don't you get discouraged because you are um, confronting so much need. Yes, but, hmm. you know, if we roll up our sleeves and work alongside people like Info Exchange in Australia and the product manager who said, I can help, I can help, that makes you, that brings so much hope and so much optimism. Hmm. Being em empathic and caring and listening to others, I think is, is more associated, if it's right, if it's wrong, to women. So this is like men do business and women are listeners and helpers, whatever, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. But the, this techie world in which you work is also thought of as a, as a man's ground. How is it for you uh, to be a female leader in this field? <laughs> Yeah, well, technology is thought of as a man's world because it is a man's world right now, <laughs> and we need to change that. So I hope for the women in the room and folks that come from other backgrounds that are underrepresented in tech, people from low-income communities, people of color, people whose parents uh, were not privileged, we need to make sure that the creators of technology, the people who are building the engineers who are building our new systems, our new platforms, they, we need to come from diverse backgrounds. Because you know, here's the thing about technology. You work on the problems that you care about and that you experience. So we have a joke about Silicon Valley that the reason why we have dating apps and laundry apps <laughs> and pizza delivery apps and you know, how to meet your girlfriend is because it's Silicon Valley is populated by a bunch of 20-year-old boys who miss their mom's role in their life. And so they're creating all of these apps to make up for it. So that's kind of a joke. But you know, in all seriousness, we need everyone at the table when we're, and we need people to not only be consumers of technology, but creators. 
So we have people like Feife, a woman who is leading, is one of our biggest leaders at Google in AI, the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And she and I have sat down, and she cares passionately about diversity and technology. And so we're thinking through, how do we get more um, women and girls into coding? Uh, so you can visit Grow with Google if you are interested in, your, in, in improving your digital skills. If you're thinking about being a programmer or a coder, fine. But even if you're just thinking, I'm interested in, in better data visualization or improving my own digital skills, you can go to Grow with Google and learn about some of the programs that are available to do that. But I really want to encourage you, really want to encourage you, Think about yourself and what you want to do in the future. Nine out of 10 jobs over the next decade are going to require some level of digital skills. And I think you know, there's a myth. People say, well, young people, you guys are all digital natives. You've got that taken care of. And that is true to a certain extent. But the interesting thing is that there's a lot of uh, young people who don't actually know how to access technology to do things like do job search or apply for jobs online or whatnot. So I'd encourage you, that's an area where you can teach others, where you can get involved to help ensure that everyone has access to that digital economy, which is such a big part of future growth and development, because we want a society where everyone has access to that, not just the privileged few. What was the difficult moment, though, still for you being a female leader? Because oh. there's... You're not going to let me off the hook with that. No, no, I'm really curious about that, if you had any. Yeah. Well, you know, I will say this. We, um, our brains are built on pattern recognition. And so a lot of our biases as humans come from our own patterns that we've seen. So for example, I was at an event recently that President Macron organized on Tech for Good. It was CEOs and heads of Tech, tech for Good. And I was one of, say, three women out of like 45 participants, right? Hmm. So you go into an environment like that, and you feel out of place. And you look around, and you think, I don't really see anyone who looks like me here. <laughs> um, so I think we need to ensure that we're creating environments that are welcoming, where people feel a sense of belonging. And if you're in a situation where you're part of the in-group, whether that's because of your ethnicity or because of your power and privilege or whatnot, that you make space for the others in that room who maybe aren't experiencing that same sense of belonging. And I think that this is something that everybody can do and everybody can make a difference. We're starting to see, I don't wanna, uh, what, what I will say about women in technology is we're seeing the tide turn. Hmm. So in fact, my daughter Hosanna is a computer scientist and she and her cohort, uh, you know, about your age, they have much better statistics on the participation of women in technology. So things are getting better, uh, but we need more women, more other underrepresented groups to consider whether technology is a career for them. Hmm. We really started with a personal question, and I'd like to finish with a personal one. Of course, all throughout the time, it was very personal. But what was, and you named so many wonderful projects, so heartbreaking, touching, brilliant things. What was uh, the last thing on thinking of that you achieved, you and your group, like driving home and on your way home, you <laughs> felt like we really do make a difference. I mean, Jesus Christ, it's really <laughs> happening. It's techy and it's people and wow. What was this? Um, I had a moment recently. Uh, so one thing about Google.org, uh, one thing about philanthropy is we really believe, look, most of the change in the world is going to happen because of markets and government. They're the huge engines of scale and growth. Philanthropy has a place especially where there are market failures and where we can bring in risk capital and be innovative and help be catalytic. And so we're always looking for ideas that the traditional money, markets, government, whatever, would be like, mm, that's some crazy shiz right there. We are, mm -hmm. not, 
we are not going near that, right? Because that's a good place, especially for a tech company. It's a good place for a tech company because we know how to take informed risk. So we had this group come into Google a few years ago, a couple PhD economists, and they, nerdy guys, and they were like, um, so we have this great idea for how to solve poverty. We're going to um, just give money to the poor. And we were like, is that really your solution? Is that, is that what your pitch, was that your pitch? Are you, you know? But what they had figured out is that we can use technology, specifically mobile technology um, to move money, systems like M-Pesa in Kenya, to empower the general public who's empathetic, I think, and very caring and wants to give, to give money directly with no conditions attached to people living in poverty in places like Kenya. This group is called Give Directly, um, and they have made this happen. And 90 cents of every dollar that's given goes directly to the poor. And we love them because they were googly, because they were doing randomized controlled trials where they really measured the impact, and they found out it's an actually incredibly effective to give money unconditionally directly to people in poverty, hardworking, good people who are simply living in poverty. But what was so exciting about their vision as well, um, so this, when we've talked to them, like th this was two guys and an idea, basically, is, is we started brainstorming about how we could actually, with this sort of approach, you could really revolutionize the entire aid industry because you could use cash as a benchmark. And you could say to anybody who's setting up a humanitarian program, okay, if you're going to take a dollar on behalf of the poor and then take out the money for administration and this and that, you know, um, if you're going to do that, you need to prove that your outcomes are better than if we simply gave that poor person the mm -hmm. dollar themselves. So it's this kind of concept that can really shift the curve on poverty and humanitarian assistance. That's super exciting to us. And so we talked to them recently, and uh, they have been working in, um, in Kenya with various governments with big aid budgets and the billions of dollars, and you know, looking at how does this work. <laughs> and the thing that was really exciting to me is that vision about we can really change how this is done <laughs> by using more of an evidence-based benchmark and really taking on an attitude of empowering the poor um, and that kind of elegant technology solution that at its heart is about bringing together technology and empathy um, is so beautiful to me. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of things we love to work at, on at Google.org. It's the kinds of things that I hope all of you get involved in in your own lives. And it's the kind of things that make me so hopeful. Thank you so much. Thank you. We and didn't thanks cry. all of you. We didn't cry. Though we had our... Yeah, it was close. There, yeah. was, there were some moments. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, everyone. Right, thank you. Thank you.